Welcome to Design Nerds Anonymous, the podcast that sparks curiosity at the intersection of business and design. I'm your host, Amanda Schneider, founder and president at ThinkLab. And good news, we're kicking off another mini season for you. Over the next few weeks, with the help of my fellow podcaster, Kaylin Reed from the Alternative Design Podcast with Kimball International, we'll be sharing new insights around each of four vertical markets, corporate, education, healthcare, and hospitality. While our mini season will share our discoveries by vertical, season six, which will release this fall, will dig even deeper and offer more ideas, tools, and insights to help you fuel inspirational discussions within your project teams. Each season built upon Think Lab's Hackathon, our biggest research project of the year. This year, we're exploring the future of customer decision-making. We're hearing that decisions for the built environment are taking longer than ever, and we wanted to know why. In this episode, we'll share insights from the corporate sector, stemming from six months of research with decision makers for the built environment, including corporate decision makers from companies like Kraft Heinz, Oracle, Airbnb, Cisco, Georgia Pacific, and many more. According to a recent Think Lab survey, 87% of corporate decision makers say that the decision making process has changed in the past few years. This episode, we'll dive into how. So if you're listening, you're either someone responsible for making decisions on behalf of your company, and we want you to know and actually hear that you're not alone. We want to engage in the process with you and facilitate dialogue that helps you streamline your project process. Or you might be a product or service provider for the built environment, perhaps an architecture design firm, commercial real estate, manufacturer, rep, or dealer. We want you to gain insight about how you can get ahead of competitors to serve your clients better by understanding what's happening in their world. So let's dive in. We asked our corporate research participants to share one word that describes how the decision-making process has changed. Some common used words in the virtual research sessions were expensive, confusing, efficiency, prototyping, opportunity, and cumbersome. So let's hear directly from some of our confessional participants that were at our live hackathon sessions. Here's a joint conversation with Suzanne and Hilda in Atlanta. I'm Suzanne Maynard and I'm with Georgia Pacific here in Atlanta and I oversee our corporate real estate for our headquarters. I am Hilda Beauchamp and I'm with Cisco Systems in their workplace resources group. For me, it's, it's ongoing and rather circular many times because you spend so much time thinking about it and talking about it and discussing it. Time passes, things change, priorities change, and therefore you start over and over again. I'd say the project process has gotten, I want to say more complicated, but it's not that it's complicated. It's that it's got a lot more need for more occupier and end user involvement in the process in order to inform why we're making the decisions for real estate or workplace so that they are really based on the business. And because of the constant changing, that's more complicated. So that was a way more than one word. I would say it's slower. What we've noticed is that the impacts are larger. So because we've spent so much time either waiting or analyzing, considering, the time has passed, so our moves are much bigger, our plays are much bigger, and our impacts are larger. And so that does have a, not only a financial impact, but a change impact, our delivery impact. And so that is just being able to get ready for that level of change to also takes more time. That's a great Great point. And I'd say part of why I say slower is because we we slow down, we stopped, we stalled, we slowed down because of the pandemic. Then to figure out what to do takes time and that's slower. And then for <laughs> everything that Hilda's saying, that magnitude of what you're undertaking is so much bigger mm -hmm. that it has to be slower. 
it's bigger plays. Yeah. You're making larger market decisions. There's more risk. I think we run the risk of having this conversation takeaway be that there is a process that is simply slower and more people involved just because that's what it is today. But there are business reasons and human change reasons that are mm-hmm. behind all of that, that I think are warranted and are not going to go anywhere. So we have an obligation or an opportunity to maybe be the voice to inform that this shift can be seen as good and we can get everybody in our industry maybe stacked around how to take this opportunity where this change is happening to change many pieces of the process. So if from our side, from the front end as end users, it's a major shift, then we have to expect our design firms and our construction and our cost analysis and our furniture and all the other dependencies to understand the shifts and and then be patient that their need to have shifts as well Mm -hmm. in their process delivery. Mm -hmm. And finally, we'll hear from Isla with Mars. This is Isla Vagal. I'm with Mars Incorporated and I am on the corporate sustainability team. People still are very uncomfortable and uncertain about the changes and everybody's still trying to figure out what the new normal looks like. Internally within Mars, there is still a lot of confusion. And so the process overall is uncertain and slow. And with the changing evolution of like how many people would be in the office and all those things are evolving. So we're trying to develop new standards with a very evolving landscape. So it's uncertain and we have to make decisions within that. So to summarize their words in terms of one word to describe how the project process has changed in the corporate sector, according to these inputs, we heard more words like uncertain, circular, slower, and clearly this last one makes sense, confusion. No wonder things are taking longer. As part of this research, ThinkLab wanted to dig deeper to understand where in the project process there's the most pain in decision-making. Our hope was that this would give context to where challenges to getting to consensus are really consolidated today. Now, our talented data visualizers at ThinkLab, shout out to Tana, created a heat map that shows where each vertical is feeling the most pain. The more intense the color, the more consolidated the pain is. And in corporate, it's no surprise they had the most intense pain of any sector concentrated up front in what we call the internal planning phase. This pain map was the source of a lot of discussion at our live event in Chicago, especially. So let's hear from one of our Chicago participants about the heat map. He's coming at this from the developer perspective. So here's Luke. Luke Roberts. I am the creative director at LG Group in Chicago. I think what was standing out to me was we were talking about that pain map a lot and some people were questioning sort of the front load of the pain map and I think what clicked for me was a subtle difference between pain and frustration. There's pain up front because we're dealing with so many people and we're having to appease so many opinions and investors and money but then once I'm with my team in my silo, yes things happen on a project of course. I have to VE something, a chair I spec is no longer here that's frustrating, but I'm with my people in my pod and we can fix that. That's part of the job, but that's an annoyance. That's a frustration. That's not the pain. So I felt like that clicked for me when people were like, no, that's why is it so red up front? I'm like, that's because everyone's there. Like that is painful, but the frustration is part of the job. That's always going to be there. We're not going to have this beautiful wrap it in a bow process, but, but that's my frustration. That's part of my role. So there's a difference between pain and frustration. Frustration is something that's expected and maybe can be mitigated through active problem solving. But at ThinkLab, we believe where there's pain, there's opportunity. So let's unpack the top three pain points or (laughs) opportunities knocking for corporate overall. And we know, again, they were most intense in that upfront portion. So number one, Lack of information and benchmarks. I'd say, especially in the corporate sector, our old metrics no longer apply. And as we all know all too well, there's no new norm yet. 
As you heard from Hilda and Suzanne in the beginning of this episode, since things have been delayed for so long, projects and decisions are larger, and thus there's more risk. Working with different regions or stakeholders to get data about attendance requires more involvement, which means more back and forth and more uncertainty in terms of what they think they need and perhaps what the actual needs are. Here's another attendee from our live event in Atlanta that brings to light how much information is lacking. Meet Danielle. I am Danielle Schmidt with HOK. I'm a principal in the Atlanta Interiors Department. It was comforting to hear everybody have some of the same challenges. Sitting at a table with most of my peers, it was interesting, again, to just have some of those same, oh, what challenges are you having? The data and the definitions and everybody calls it slightly different. Like when you call square footage per person, what are, are we talking rentable? Are we talking usable? What are you counting in that? Coming up with it, some of those standards. Utilization, what does utilization mean? Is it a badge report that somebody's pulling and... We can argue the merits of that kind of data, but still, it's just, it's interesting to hear some of the challenges that everybody else is having too. And here's Hilda again, commenting on additional discussion shared in her small discussion group at the live event. The conversation around data was a heavy one and the lack of the benchmarking. We've always had that as almost a security blanket to our decision-making process. And now that we either don't have it or need to change it or need to rethink it, it's giving angst, more angst than I saw to the people in the room. The second major challenge for the corporate sector is definitely not new, but we certainly heard that it's intensified. Change management. Because they're trying new prototypes, if the why behind the change isn't communicated properly, and isn't understood by those intended to use the new types of spaces, it can truly create more risk. One of our other interviewees described this pain point well with his one word, nimble, and describes some new needs for communication with his clients' clients. I'm Matt Revy. I'm with AECOM. I am the design director for the Chicago Interior Practice. We have to be nimble in the fact that we are dealing with still a lot of change, both from our clients and from the people that our clients might even still need to answer to, because sometimes my client isn't the end user, right? So their end users may have new demands, schedules have demands. So we've had to be extremely nimble in being able to switch position, pivot, to still service them in the way that they need and expect. It's really boiling down the conversation to the minimal amount of information you need the executive summary, but even that sometimes is too much, right? I really liked a lot of the comments that came about during your conversation around the agility that the team at Kraft Heinz was doing. I thought that was really fascinating and how I could understand that and maybe take some of that back. Now with this last comment, Matt is referring to a description from one of our panelists, Tope Sadiku. She's the head of strategy with Kraft Heinz. She was talking about a lasagna recipe. Especially as Americans, it seems that all of us want a magic formula or pill that's going to fix our problems. But Tope had a great analogy with lasagna. She thinks of the unique challenges of each global region in her organization, like a lasagna recipe. No one recipe is perfect for every audience, but you can create a foundation and substitute out for the special needs of each group. For example, your family may be gluten-free, and so you can substitute out noodles in one recipe. Or maybe you have someone with a dairy allergy, so you substitute out the cheese in that lasagna. So while many agreed we won't likely go back to formulaic solutions, we can perhaps find a recipe that we can adapt to each audience's unique needs through testing and evaluation. All right, and the third and final pain point that led to all that consolidated red upfront in the corporate pain map, this was probably the most discussed in all of our live sessions. It was the need to manage up. As we explore the change when it comes to decision-making in recent years, especially in this sector, we're hearing a lot about transition. We heard one story about a large and very well-known global corporate entity that will remain nameless, but their real estate function within the entity started out reporting to the CEO, 
then during the pandemic moved under the CHRO, that's the Chief Human Resources Officer, then one more stop and finally landed under the CFO. Now that is a lot of transition in just a few years. Another real estate leader from a financial services firm said in a Think Lab session, most leaders didn't grow up in commercial real estate. And most of the presentations from product and service partners are truly created for people who know this world that we're living in. He said, I spend a ton of time translating it for them. This leads to exponential effort spent, not just in the traditional sense of change managing the people using the space, but truly managing up. Now here's Melissa, a participant in the Chicago session who explains the discussion well. Hi, my name is Melissa Huff. I'm with Office Revolution, and my role is the Director of Workplace Innovation. I really liked the conversation that got a lot of people nodding around managing up, and I think a lot of the challenges of getting that buy-in and getting things to move forward, what's holding it up is that managing up and selling up within the company to the decision makers, who now are a little bit maybe lower in the totem pole than they used to be. It's not like the CEO is running these projects, but ultimately the CEO or a CHRO or a CFO is going to dictate to to their team. It made me think, how as an industry can we be more transparent and outline our value and how can it get packaged in a way that we can help them sell that upstream? So a big thank you to Melissa, Suzanne, Hilda, Luke, Danielle, Matt, and so many others for sharing their perspective in our confessionals at our live events and to our anonymous callers for our hotline. Now that we all have this collective perspective and understanding, in the second half of this episode, we are going to give you context and insight as to how we might collectively help solve for these challenges. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Kaylin. Hey listeners, this is Kaylin Reed, and I'm a design futurist at Kimball International and host of the Alternative Design Podcast, Amanda invited me on the show to help draw some parallels between ThinkLab's latest hackathon results on the future of customer decision-making and what we're seeing more broadly. As a foresight practitioner, my job is to look for data and trends that are happening in the design industry and beyond that spark uncertainties about our future. Then I dive into those uncertainties to identify future possibilities or what we call scenarios. From there, We can actually begin to establish potential threats and opportunities that help guide today's decision-making for tomorrow's reality. We do this and much more on the Alternative Design Podcast, which you should totally check out after listening to this episode. So with that said, so much of what Amanda and the Hackathon guests are revealing about the pain points in today's decision-making tells us a lot about how the future of customer decision-making could unfold for workplace. And I want to, for just a moment, zoom out and look at what's happening on a broader scale. We know that Workplace post-pandemic is desperately trying to settle into a new way of doing things, and the shift we're observing in human behavior isn't making that very easy. Hybrid workers are wanting to personalize their daily schedules more than ever before, and they're expecting the built environment to give them the opportunity to do anything everywhere. You know, like Lifetime gyms are starting to encourage hybrid workers to stay and work on their laptops all day. For the longest time, the conversation around hybrid work centered around two locations, the office and home. But data is showing that third places are becoming a worthy rival to these conventional workplaces. So, but what does that tell us? Well, it could mean that the way people are working is changing. And this will be even more true as people continue to leverage AI like personal interns writing their emails and using spoken word to prompt task instructions. So we need to be offering more choice in the built environment on where and how work gets done by including not only traditional focus setups, but things like lounges and cafes. And the big question here on how to future-proof these spaces is how can you design a space that can shift between these setups on demand? And speaking of lounges and cafes, we are absolutely seeing the workplace leveraging amenity spaces as a way to make the office truly a destination by design. Some companies that are located in mixed-use environments are actually sharing amenity and common spaces 
while others are opening these spaces up to the public, challenging the status quo on what was once considered privately owned offices that weren't accessible to the local community. We go into this in season three of the Alternative Design podcast, where we share our forecast on the future of the workplace in 2030. But if we tie this balloon of future possibilities down to customer decision making, there are some questions and uncertainties to ponder before Amanda and I get to the so what's and give you some practical takeaways that you need to take action. If workers are increasingly doing everything everywhere, what are the new metrics that organizations will use to inform decision making when traditional occupancy and even square foot per employee metrics get complicated? If employees increasingly view the office as a destination where they can combine various activities and services like grocery shopping, dining, attending a yoga class, how can we integrate these into the office environment itself? Or alternatively, how can we take advantage of nearby amenities to meet this evolving demand? This could point to more end users and even community members as stakeholders in the design process. We could see unusual partnerships in the corporate center emerge in trying to share real estate, which could mean even more unique challenges, needs, and perspectives that the workplace will need to solve for. I always love Caitlin's perspective, so much so that for the final section of this episode, I've invited her back to join me in a dialogue to help all of us digest some of the fantastic ideas that we've gathered as part of this research. I'm going to kick off this last section with three tangible ideas. These came from a combination of the live sessions in Chicago, Atlanta, and New York, where all the varying members of our ecosystem around the built environment spent time together discussing this research and brainstorming the so what together. But you'll also hear that some of these ideas came from our private sessions, which were all of the end users from corporate kind of sitting together and saying, okay, this hurts, but what can we do about it? So the first idea was shift from space metrics to performance metrics. Now, this was an idea generated from our Atlanta session, and it's really about generating a new set of industry norms based on outcomes. There was a lot of discussion at that session about this lack of data, but it's really not lack of data. We actually have tons of data. We have too much data. We can't make sense of it. And a lot of the old metrics just no longer apply because we're thinking about space differently. And we're thinking about the ways we measure success differently. So this was about not just occupancy and utilization, but pricing, labor, and a whole lot more. First of all, I think there is a permeating question as we try and figure out post-pandemic workplace. We are continually asking the question, what is that new security blanket? And by security blanket, we used to talk about the usable square feet. We used to talk about square feet per person. We used to talk about, again, that utilization rate that you mentioned. And I think what we're seeing now is exactly like you mentioned, there's more stuff to this equation. And one of the things that I just want to throw out there is that I think it's very possible that we're going to see well-being metrics be in this recipe too. It could honestly start to even maybe replace some of those traditional productivity metrics that we've seen. And we're seeing that it's taking businesses some time to get there, but we're also seeing an increasing correlation to the holistic health of employees and a company's bottom line. And this is especially true when you think about all of that in the context of the fact that productivity rates globally are actually declining despite all of these new advances in technology and AI and all these things that are supposed to make us more productive. And in fact, we're not. And so before we make that a remote versus in-person conversation, I think we actually need to be digging a little bit deeper into why people aren't productive. I think we could see this become more and more recognized in the future, which really could inform this shift to more well-being metrics as a barometer of team and even company success. And I would say we definitely heard a lot about this. This data piece was discussed heavily in each of our live events, Chicago, New York, but especially Atlanta. And it's interesting because I'm wearing my whoop. I see you have your aura ring on. And it, it brings up an interesting point because you and I are both focused on avoiding burnout and our own health. But what happens when we have to give that data to our employer. We've all read the articles about people implanting chips in their arms and things like that. But how do we shift to these outcome metrics, these health metrics that I think we can agree as a society, especially Gen Z, would definitely agree we need without kind of upsetting that balance or making us afraid to give this information to our employers? 
something that we explored in our last season of the Alternative Design Podcast was really designers and even some of these decision makers needing to become champions of where and when transparency with data is happening. We've got aura rings and Fitbits, but what happens when that stuff starts to be embedded into furniture and you're in a workplace environment where it, you know, you're sitting in a task chair that's able to capture heart rate variability and stress metrics and all sorts of things. How do we as decision makers, as designers, as product manufacturers, really uphold ethics with that data, really championing how that data is being used and how people can use it more personally um, to empower a better user experience for themselves. I think this gets really interesting because this is a natural one that speaks directly to the end users listening that are trying to figure out how to do this. You can imagine this aggregated data being a great recruiting source or a great way to show that you're a great place to work, maybe retain employees. I look at this for our partners and I look at the capability, whether you're commercial real estate or A&D, for them to aggregate all of their clients in some way. If there was a way to access this data to share back as a starting point of best practices. Something to keep in mind here as we continue towards the future is understanding a really major shift in human behavior that's happened. And that is that people are increasingly wanting to do everything everywhere. And it's really shaking up how employees are wanting to use the office space. Um, They're wanting to come not just for focus work, but they increasingly want to have more things that they can do in one place. As manufacturers, uh, as we're trying to understand more and more about this change in human behavior, how are people using space? What's going to be necessary? We might need to be thinking in terms of what are the furniture solutions and, and different design products that are going to facilitate this shift in human behavior. One thing that I've been thinking of off the top of my head, I think that personalized storage solutions in the built environment is a, a huge opportunity for furniture manufacturers as we have the opportunity for food to be delivered. Imagine being able to go into the office and just being able to pick up your Whole Foods order that was dropped into a personalized locker, right? We are starting to see uh, whispers of this starting to really manifest. And it's something that I think as furniture manufacturers and product manufacturers, we need to be watching and really making sure that our solutions are tailored to this shift that we're observing. I have three boys, so I'm not sure that a locker could be big enough to fit all yeah, of the groceries, I know. The, the Costco cart that I need to in there. But that is it's true. an amazing, an amazing observation. Let's move on to our second idea for this corporate sector, which was really around clarifying roles on the decision making team. Now, this one came up a lot in Atlanta. And one of my favorite things about some of the discussions where this came up was really the cross-pollination between sectors. So in Atlanta, we had everything from education to corporate to we had an amazing woman, Hallie Hannaford, who you'll hear on several different episodes this season, who is from Chick-fil-A. And one thing I think corporate can learn from hospitality is today, because now they're serving clients so differently, which you'll hear more about in the hospitality episode, they have to move this process faster to seize this opportunity that's out there. And I think that this is a real opportunity for corporate, because as we heard earlier in this episode, the most pain of any sector was in corporate in that pre-planning before the project even starts. They're really getting hung up on decision making, likely due to some of this lack of data. And there are more people than ever in the decision making proverbial room. Our stats from Think Lab say that the number of decision makers on the average project has officially doubled in the last five years. So one of the pieces of advice was if you can clarify roles on the decision-making team, really clarify who's at the meeting to decide what exactly these meetings are there to do, I think there's a lot of opportunities. I echo the same thing, that we are definitely seeing that there are more and more decision-makers that are coming to the table, and and especially decision-makers that may have gotten to that table by untraditional means. And so what I mean by that is that there's a shift that's happening in terms of Uh, organizations that are valuing these transferable skills instead of maybe just the traditional experience, like you worked in a different company in the same sector for like 10 years. And so when we look at the change in that hiring process and really what we're seeing being signaled as a change in value in what employees are bringing to the table, 
we could absolutely see um, folks in middle management and even upper management that are getting into these roles in unconventional and untraditional ways. And so as we continue to see that, as we see even AI start to disrupt these roles, again, I think we're going to see that these decision makers that are at the table are going to need more education because they're coming in with these transferable skills, perhaps even from a different industry. And they're coming to the table as a decision maker and they need to be empowered with knowledge. And so there's this knowledge transfer that has to happen. You mentioned earlier in the episode that's this managing up concept. And, and I would say that it's managing up and out, right? We've always had employees that are needing to explain uh, the ROI and sell or pitch to our customers that are out. But now we're actually saying that they're needing to teach and educate their bosses on best practices and industry standards and all sorts of things. To underline your point, clarifying the role of the decision-making team, whether that's in a weighted structure. I don't care if you're like needing to use a racy model, figure out who needs to be an approver, who needs to drive the situation. But identifying that early on, I think could really untangle some of this messy start that we're seeing in corporate. Mm -hmm. Which is so interesting because some of these problems are not necessarily new. They're just maybe uh, elevated. I think that RACI model is a fantastic example of systems that have existed for some time that maybe we need to reopen, relook at that will help us get to consensus. I grew up in this commercial real estate world. My new bosses, they did not. So a yeah. lot of what is presented is assuming a certain level of baseline knowledge. And I want to challenge that we're going to, as we look at managing up, we're going to have to look at everything that's presented. In the furniture realm, we use an example of, can you verify that all the parts are here? And we send them a line item listing of parts that is almost like showing up as if you're buying a car and laying all the car parts out on their lawn and saying, can you sign this and verify that all the car parts are here? Most people could not, and nor would you want to buy a car that way. And I think this is really going to push our industry to think differently about how we simplify our message, how we simplify our approvals to really help not only clarify roles on the decision making team, but enable those decisions to happen faster and easier. So let's move on to our third and final one for workplace, which is very related, which is help your contact sell up. This came directly from the workplace sector. So this was a private session where we had various workplace decision makers in uh, what we keep jokingly calling group therapy, because that's what it feels like to a lot of them. And they're struggling with all of these things that we've been discussing, more players on the decision committee, and how do they do their job? One of the ways that I think was really interesting to me that was discussed in New York was even around sharing asynchronously. We tend to wait until the meeting happens and share everything with them, fire hose them, and expect them to be able to make a decision when they're not even super familiar with this industry or really what all of the nuanced implications are for each decision that they're making. So I think this was a real idea to say, how could you drip it out? Maybe with short form video, maybe with a Miro board. There's lots of different ways that you can start to share information in advance that maybe would make those decision making meetings a little bit easier. Speaking from the product manufacturer side, it can be easy to do exactly what you said. Hey, I'm going to show up. I'm going to wow you with a 30-minute presentation. And I think going back to how do we translate insights, how do we not just spit up data, but we actually synthesize some of that for them and we're actually connecting the dots. And again, connecting those dots in a pre-experience, a present experience, and a post-experience is going to be increasingly powerful for really people are wanting is the so what. The attention spans of not just people in corporate, but, but even in leadership, it's, it's ever shorter, right? <laughs> Nobody has time to sit through long presentations. What is the bottom line? How can you nuggetize that information into something that can be digestible to your point? Because we have to empower and recognize that folks are going to absorb and digest and analyze information differently. And so that means thinking beyond just the talking head model and maybe an email before the presentation with a PDF. How can we get more creative to your point with short form video or visualization tools, something that's more collaborative, like a Miro board? Again, I think that the more that we can incorporate a variety of options for people to choose from, uh, the more that we can get these decision makers really empowered um, to make this process less painful. And I think it's really interesting as we look at kind of the attention span of society right now, because I want to say between millennials and Gen Z that the average attention span has nearly been cut in half. Like darn that. social so, media. I know, darn social media. <laughs> but it's a reality we're all going to have to face and figure out. And I think we can shake our heads at the Gen Zers. But 
all of us, when you get an email that's 500 words long, like I think we all look kind at the of, bottom. right, we all sigh a little bit. So I would encourage uh, our listeners to take a listen to, there's a man named Donald Miller. He wrote a book called Story Brand. It's really about branding. But I think we could pull some of those same branding concepts, even to some of these decision-making teams. If you follow him on Instagram or any other social media platform, he also does a really great job of making these short form videos about any number of different topics. And they're so short and so impactful and easy to process. I think even when it comes to project teams and things like that, maybe there's ways that we can steal his formula, learn from that. Well, that's it for this episode. But we don't want the launch of this mini season to be the end. We hope it's just the beginning. So if you are a corporate decision maker, or perhaps you frequently work on projects in this sector, we'd love to hear from you. What have we missed? If this sparked something for you, I want to personally invite you to call our hotline at 917-934-2942 and leave us a message. We're preparing for season six of this podcast, and you just may find your voicemail included. Then stay tuned next week for our episode on the not-so-hidden culprits behind approval bottlenecks in the education sector. Our goal with this mini-season is cross-pollination. So even if you don't work in the sector, rest assured there will be something in this episode for you. Here's a final quote that I can't stop thinking about. So until next week, I'll leave you with this. Stephen South, Design Director at Spectre Group. The one thing we don't really talk about in the design community is the real estate side for most businesses is their biggest cost, but it is not a revenue generator. And so when they're looking at the finances of a company, they do a lot of big investment in real estate knowing that they're not getting a direct financial benefit. So the real estate people end up within a business, they're not money makers, they're the spenders. Their role and how they're seen is very differently than how we see them. And if you understand that and help them, it can help the process a lot. A lot better. Really awesome. <laughs>